Hello, gorgeous souls, and welcome to this live Q&A session. We are in the Shoot from the Heart Society. This is a special session to answer questions, particularly about selling your script, although I'm happy to take questions or also just about writing your script, and also like how to get your script on the screen. So that'll be the focus of our conversation today. If you are new around here, I am Diane Val. Hello, welcome. If you've been here a while, hello and welcome to you. I'm so happy to see you. People, I'm seeing somebody has just arrived, so we're starting to find the live, the link. I'm going to take a little couple minutes just to let people find this before we really dive into it. <clears throat> As you may be able to hear, I don't know how this happened, but today, and I don't know why, but I've started to lose my voice. <laughs> and I have no idea because I haven't even been sick or anything. I went into Barcelona today. I don't know if it was the pollution. I don't know if it was the excitement of being in Barcelona with my kids. But you can hear me. I am croaky. So just a word of warning about it. And we'll see how my voice goes. I may have to like short, you know, call this a little shorter because as you can hear, who knows? Who knows? All right. I'm going to say hi to the people who are here. I'm so happy you're joining me live. Nikki from Scotland. Hello there. Nikki Duncan. I have so many friends with a surname Duncan. How are you? What part of Scotland are you in? I'm so happy that you're here. Les, hello. I just saw your post about joining uh, LinkedIn. That's awesome. I do think it's a really good thing for screenwriters right now. I have not, like I have a LinkedIn profile, but I don't use it. I haven't looked at it for a long time, but I'm just, I'm just hearing again and again from screenwriters how well it's working for them. So Dempsey, hello. Good to see you. I'm so excited for you. I just always see your posts and I'm like, oh, so many exciting things happening. Saul, hello. Lisa, thank you. I say, I don't actually even feel sick. I have no idea what's going on here. <laughs> Sana, thank you. I do have a big, this is my jug of tea. I have a big tea and I had a big spoonful of honey before I started. And I, say, I don't know if it's just been the excitement of going into Barcelona today. But I'm croaky. I'm croaky. I don't know what it is. So we'll, we'll, we'll deal with it. Right, I am going to get started on the questions because a bunch of people have been posting questions in the actual group. And then a couple people DM'd me questions. So I'm going to address those. And then please, though, if you're here live, uh, in Fife, in Glasgow, Fife, lovely. My, I don't know if you know, my family live in North Berwick, just outside of Edinburgh. I love Scotland. I love it. I love it. We just booked our tickets for the summer. I'm so excited. All right, so I'm going to, Christiane, hello, so good you're here. I'm going to start this by answering the questions that were in our group. And then, but <clears throat> if you have a question, if you're here live and you have a question, there's something you want to ask, go ahead and put it in the chat. And what I'll do is I'll make sure that I come to them uh, in the order that they were asked. The first question I wanted to address was one from our group today. <clears throat> Yeah, thank you, Nikki. I know North Berwick's gorgeous. All of Scotland's gorgeous. It's beautiful there. And we've got our, oh, I'm so excited this summer. Actually, we booked our tickets down to go to, um, down to Dumfries. I was born in Dumfries. If you don't know me, I was born in Dumfries, Scotland. So I'm from, I'm from, I'm a Dunhamer, as they say. And we're going down there to go to this castle. We did it last summer and I swear to God it was the highlight of the summer. <laughs> going to Carlavrock Castle. Because historic Scotland do this thing where they do a jousting tournament. It was the, my sons loved it. And so we're going back again this year and I'm so excited. I can't wait. I can't wait. All right, let's dive into this. Um, so Stephanie Mitchell, Michelle wrote to us and said, um, doo -doo -doo -doo. how easy is it? And I think this question comes up a lot in different versions. How easy is it to sell your screenplay with the option to keeping yourself attached as let's say the screenwriter for any changes they make during filming and as a producer as well, so may still have some input on changes or is that asking too much, thanks. So Stephanie, the deal here is that when you take your screenplay out to market and people show interest in it, you're perfectly entitled to say to those people, and I think there's a period in which you're getting to know that person. It's very rare just to send a script out. I don't think this ever happens really, and someone would just buy it. They want to meet you, they want to talk with you, and it's really figuring out if you are a good fit to work together. And that's when in the process, you know, you would say to them, hey, you know, my real dream scenario is first of all, I don't want anybody else to be writing this. Like it's my script and I want to be with us through the end. And if there's rewrites to be done, I want to be the one that does it. 
And, you know, either the producer is going to be like, I understand that. But to be honest, we don't, you know, like we suspect that we would need to work with another writer. We see that there's some flaws in the script that we'd really like to address. And we're not sure if you're the right person. And they might say that to you. Right. And at that point, you'll get to choose. Like you get to decide whether it's more important to you just to sell that script and actually uh, give up on the control that you imagined in an ideal world you would have. Or you can decide whether you actually are going to pass on that producer because that's not what you want and you have a different idea of what you want. And so to be honest, it's, it's not that it's asking too much. It's going to take some producers out of the equation, right? Like if you said, I want to be a producer on the script to make choices about who's acting in it and what it's, you know, like how it's going to go. Some producers, they're just going to be like, that's a hard no for me. Like you're not, you know, we don't want another producer on this. And at that point, you'll have, you just have to make the decision. And I think it really is about that for each of us as screenwriters on this journey, <clears throat> never to be desperate when we're taking our work out to the market. You don't have to accept a deal that you don't like. Like if somebody says, well, I really want to take your script, but I'm not going to take it, you know, but we want to hire somebody else to rewrite it. And that's just like an absolute hard no for you. You've got to stay in alignment with your own integrity and have the courage to say to that person, thanks, but no. Right. So it's not asking too much. It's totally possible as you go on this journey and as people read your work and as people make offers to you, you might find that actually you're willing to accept a different thing than what you think you would, you know, because you realize actually it's more important to me to sell it than it is to hold on to the control of it. So <clears throat> it's, it's a journey. But it's not asking too much. And I think it is helpful at the beginning of the process as a screenwriter to get clear about what your ideal is, right? Like, what would you really like, right? So that you can, when you start to meet different producers, like voice that, express that. And it's kind of like, I always think, it is like you're getting in a relationship with somebody and until there's contracts, you're just dating. And what you want to do when you're dating and you're going through that process, like they've said, OK, I like your script. Can we jump on a call and talk about it? You know, you're you're you don't want to fake out who you are. Right. You want to be really honest and say, like, this is what matters to me. And if they're not a right fit, then they're not the right fit. And to have the courage of that. The very famous example of this that often gets sort of touted around, of course, is uh, sliced alone with his script, Rocky, because, um, you know, he took that script to market and. Immediately, people were like, OK, we want to we want to make that, you know, I want to buy it from you. And he was absolutely adamant in that case that he acted in it. And the other producers were like, we don't want you. <laughs> There's no way we want you. Right. And he was like, well, that's how it is. Like, either you take me to act in it or you don't have it. You know, it's not going to be yours. And it's having that courage, you know, and eventually, of course, sliced alone. Famously, you know, he got what he wanted. He got to act in his movie. He, he got them to make the movie that he wanted to make. And it's just about having, you know, I think for each of us, the courage, if we really feel that like, oh, like, I, I, like this has got to be me, then we've got to have the courage to step up and fight for that. But it won't necessarily be given to us if we don't ask for it or if we don't demand it or if we don't, um, if we don't really value it. And I think that's the point, like when you hear that Sly Stallone story and there's like so many parts to it, I don't know if you've heard the whole story, but it's an incredible story about how he sold Rocky. Um... Obviously, he was so completely committed to the idea that he was going to be in it. I mean, it was just like, like he would rather not make the movie than sell it. And they actually offered him quite a lot of money for the script. And considering the fact at that point in his life, he was completely broke. I mean, he had no money. I think actually the story goes that he'd even sold his dog. <laughs> yeah, he was so broke, he'd given his dog away to somebody, right? And he had no money. And for him to actually turn down this offer of money, which was, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars or something, because, you know, he was committed to this vision that he had of it, it takes immense courage and immense commitment to your vision. And it just depends if you really do have that level of commitment. And it's not wrong if you don't, if you're like, yeah, I'd like to be the only writer on it, but actually at the end of the day, it doesn't matter to me that much. Like I'd rather cash the check, <laughs> you know, it's all good. So all to say, um, it's not too much to ask. It's totally possible, but it's really up to you to negotiate that and to be committed to that if that's what you want. Um, <clears throat> Victoria had added to that uh, a question which said, I'm trying to 
co-production with some of mine and have already developed but want to work with established teams and studios and in many cases actors. How do I keep control of casting roles where I want specific actors but agents are in the way? <laughs> like my thought there is that agents are not in the way. I mean, agents are the conduits, agents are the deal makers. Um, you know, if an actor doesn't want to do it, or an actor is not interested, it's not what they're doing right now. And usually the agent knows what an actor is looking for. We might not like it, but usually an agent is pretty aware what their talent, what their clients are seeking and what kind of work they're available for. For instance, an actor, you know, might be like, they might be like, say, really in big Marvel movies, right? And right now, though, they're looking for some small character indie movie where they can really show that they've got like acting chops, right? And so the agent knows they're looking for that kind of thing. So now they're like, aha, when they hear about your film, that's like this smaller indie, like they're like, aha, this is the kind of thing they're interested in. And they'll take it because agents like to offer work to their clients. They're excited to do that, right? As long as it's a good fit. But if they know, for instance, on the flip side, that this actor is like, just in this place now, they want to do a TV thing or they want to do, um, you know, they want to do a big Marvel movie. They're like, they want a big thing. They want big studio. They don't want this kind of thing. They're not going to take it to them, you know, and you can't, you, we don't control that. No matter how much we want certain actors for our roles, we don't control whether we get them or not. And certainly not as writers, not as producers, though. Nobody, like nobody ever controls that. And casting is often a long and very <clears throat> challenging process uh, with a lot of rejection involved. And typically, it, you know, I think most scripts go to a lot of actors before the actors who say yes, say yes. And no one ever talks about that side of it because, you know, nobody wants to either embarrass the actor who did take the role, you know, by saying, oh, I turned that down, you know, because that just wouldn't be nice. But also they don't want to do it because sometimes they look like fools for having turned it down. It's like, oh my God, you're crazy that like, you turned down that, like, you know. Um, so nobody talks about it, but it's normal that like, you know, you go out to cast a film and it goes to many actors and they turn it down and it goes to more actors and they turn it down and it goes to more and, it, and that's kind of casting. So we don't control casting to an extent, even as producers. Now, as a writer, the only way that you're going to get to have any say in the casting, i.e. who it's going to go to is if you are a producer on the film, right? Because the people who cast the movie ultimately who will decide who's going to be in the film it's the, it's the director and the producer. It's not the writer. The writer does not have any say in that whatsoever, really, in a normal film. The people who will decide that are the director and the producer. And the director and the producer will sometimes argue about it because the director has a creative vision that they are like, this actor is perfect. And the producer is like, I can't sell the movie with that person. Then that can get pretty ugly, right? <clears throat> but even the director and producer don't actually control the casting because... You know, it's, it's, it's just a, it's, it's a wild field out there. It's like human beings, you're dealing with humans. It's not predictable. You never know what people are going to want to do, not want to do. All you can do is get your, your, your script the best thing it can be and then take it out to those places and, and hope that somebody bites, you know, hope somebody sees it and gets it and wants to do it and fights for it. So that's that. Um, <clears throat> any advice for not having got accredited for Khan? So I have two thoughts on the, like, accreditation for Khan thing like <clears throat> to be honest if you are wanting to go to make connections and pitch a project to people and hopefully connect with financiers or producers or indeed talent you don't need to be accredited like when i went to can to sell quote unquote my first script which is how i sold it i didn't actually sell it at the can film festival but i met the producer who introduced me to the producer who optioned the script so for me, like going to con, you know, was the catalyst to selling my script. I didn't have accreditation. I didn't even try to get accreditation. I was a yoga teacher, <laughs> you know, I just like went there. And, you know, if you're in con during the festival, it's just loaded with everybody from the industry from all around the world. There's parties going on everywhere. And there's, you know, people in the bars, the hotel lobby. It's just like one big film festival shebang. And I just went and I just talked to people. Like, I didn't have accreditation. I, didn't, I couldn't go into the official things. I just went and I just like, 
smooched around and spoke to whoever and, you know, went out to dinner and talked to whoever was at the table next to me and went to the hotel lobby and chatted to people. And I know it sounds terrible. Blagged my way into a few parties, but that's how I did it, you know? So I would just say that you don't necessarily need accreditation to actually uh, make things happen at Cannes. And I came away from that Cannes Film Festival. I was like very, you know, I was like so focused on trying to get my script out there that <clears throat> I just, I mean, I just talked to everybody and anybody I could and, you know, I, and got their cards, got their business cards. And by the end of like, I was there for maybe, I don't know, four or five, probably five days or six days or something. And I had like a stack of guards, you know, <laughs> and I had a stack of new contacts that I hadn't had a week before. And most of them never led me to anything. But as I say, that one producer that I'd met who was totally legit, that one producer introduced me to another producer because he was like, I love the sound of your movie. He's like, it's not for me, but I love the sound of that movie. And then, you know, a couple months later, he called me up and said, or he emailed me, he didn't call me up, he emailed me and said, hey, you know, I'm just wondering if you're still looking for someone with a script because I met somebody last night who could be a good fit. So, you know, that's how it can happen. So if you're just looking to create connections and create a network in the industry, going to something like Khan or Sundance is, I think, a great strategy, you know, because there's nothing to be actually face to face. There's nothing to be actually chatting to people and connecting with them in real life. You can spend as much time on your social media and I love it, but I just feel like there's something in the personal which is completely different. And at these places like Cannes <clears throat> or Sundance or Berlin, but I think especially Cannes and Sundance in a way, you know, people really like, especially Cannes, like even more than anything, I'm just like Cannes, probably Venice as well. I've never been to Venice, but like, I think Cannes is like the film industry goes there to enjoy themselves. They love it. Like everybody is happy to be there. Every producer, every direct, like everybody is happy to be in Cannes. Of course they are. It's like the end of winter. It's, you know, they're in the Mediterranean. It's so glamorous. They're the red carpet and people running around in evening gowns in the middle of the day. And it's just like fabulous. And everybody's happy to be there. And so people are in a good mood. Your ability to access people is unparalleled, you know, because it's just like that thing of this person, you know, you're just chatting to this person who's walking down La Closet at the same time. You're like, hey, how are you doing? What are you seeing? What are you here with? Are you here with a movie? It's magic. So <clears throat> I don't think you need to have accreditation. I wouldn't get fixated on it. I feel like there's possible uh, ways to just go there and, and create connections and get things to do, you know, get things, make connections even without accreditation. Okay. Um, da -dum, les. Several folks had LinkedIn accounts. Yes. You're presently setting up. Okay, that's great. I think the, the LinkedIn is super, I say, I just, I, like, I just fascinated by it. The, the screenwriters I know who've said to me recently that they have sold things as a result of it through it. Okay. Now I'm going to check out things here. And then I do have a couple in the, in my DMS, but I'm going to check out what you are asking in the chat before we get crazy here. And if you're, if you have come on here since we started, hello. And, um, you may notice my voice is a little dicky. I'm not sick. I don't know what's going on. My voice just disappeared today. I think it was going to Barcelona and having too much fun. <laughs> so apologies. Hopefully I will survive. Okay. One of my questions is, will the savvy screenwriter stay in the network or is it a time limited course there? It will stay in the network. So the way that I'm working things at the moment, and I, you know, who knows for how long, right? But the way that I'm working at the moment is that there's a library of courses in the network and it's always growing. That's my desire for it. So there will be new things because I know that there's a, there's a freshness and a liveliness to doing something that's kind of like live and happening then. So we're going to do the Savvy Screenwriter starting on May 5th. It is a six week course. You could join later and do it later. Obviously, I feel like there will be a certain energy in doing it you know, while we drip it live for the first time. So it's going to start May 5th and then once a week. And I think like obviously during the Zooms and so forth, we will be talking about that. But there's absolutely no reason if you wanted to join later in the year, then you could join later in the year and that course will be there. I am so excited about this course. I feel like I haven't maybe talked about it enough about what it is and why it's so special. But I feel like this is, this is the missing piece. Like this is the course that, covers the things that really will move the needle, that will make the difference. You know, yes, there's going to be some practicals in it. Yes, there are going to be things about 
you know, <clears throat> the actual how of selling your script. But it's going to be so much deeper than that. And I just feel like this is something that's really not addressed anywhere. And it is the missing piece. It's the, it's, and it's the big piece. It is the piece. Because I just think of this all the time. Like the people who are selling scripts, the people who actually make that transition to becoming professional screenwriters, it's not the people necessarily at all who are most talented who have written the best scripts. And what's kind of sad about that is that so many of us spend so much time and so much energy writing our scripts and making our scripts good and then writing more scripts and making them good and really getting great at this craft, but not addressing these mindset things. And the truth is you cannot like out manifest your mindset. You cannot create results that are beyond what you believe to be possible at any given time. And that's always going to put a lid on you. And it's funny that like, I mean, if you feel a lot of resistance to this, when I say this, if you're like, that's not true, you know, like it's just, it's all that matters is writing a great script. And if I write a great script, it's going to sell. If you believe that, I'm just going to say good luck. Right. But there is a way to actually master the mindset, to learn what that looks like, to learn like really how to do this so that you shift your perceptions, you shift your identity, and then you start to actually just create these results effortlessly. And I always go back to selling my own script. It was like, it was pretty effortless, right? And it wasn't effortless because I'd written the best script ever. <laughs> I hadn't written the best script ever. In fact, some people had read the script and were like, dude, you need to work on this script. I mean, it was not great. It was my first script, right? But the reason I was able to sell it really was my mindset was like locked in. And I was doing so many of the things that I'm going to teach you about in this program. Like, I just want to give you these tools. And these tools will change your life, like whatever you want to do, right? Because it, like you can apply what you learn in the Savvy Screenwriter to so many different areas of life. We're going to be focused though on screenwriting in particular, right? Like how do we shift ourselves from being somebody who feels a little desperate, who feels a little bit threatened, who feels a little intimidated, who feels a little bit like an outsider, how can we just shift you, flick the switch inside so that you don't feel like that anymore? Because the minute you don't feel like that and you're not feeling like you've got these people up on pedestals, the minute you don't feel like you're in any way desperate, that's when you'll start to move the needle. The minute you step into your power as a screenwriter where you're just like, I got the goods, right? And you start to exude that energy and you start to vibrate from that energy and you start to take action from that energy, that's what's going to move the needle. Not like following the instructions to write all these query letters every day and like do all this research and do all the things. And that is a part of it, but it's just the tiniest part. Like the real part is this internal shift because when you shift internally, it is absolutely unavoidable that your external reality will shift too. The external re world is always reflecting your internal world, always. Like the results that you have right now in your life they are a direct reflection of your conditioning up to this point and your subconscious beliefs up to this point. Everything in your life. And when you realize that and you realize I can take control over this, like, and if I shift the inside, when I change my inside, the outside changes. And that's how it works. Right? When you change who you are on the inside, it will change. It's, it's, it's universal law. It's unavoidable. <laughs> So that's what this course is going to be. And I'm, I'm super excited about it. I feel like it's just the exact thing, the exact thing that's needed for so many people. And it's going to be really cool. And it's not like anything else that's being taught anywhere, as far as I'm aware. <laughs> Tell me if it is. You've seen this other like mindset for screenwriter course. No, this is going to be amazing. So we start May 5th. And just so you know, this is the last day to get in the network for a year for $999. This is like a huge saving. 999 for a whole year and that's a whole year of my support a whole year of my mentorship a whole year of like doing the courses there's a lot of programs in there already you will get access to whatever comes out while you're a member i mean that's one time fee for one whole year it's a fantastic offer i can't yeah i can't stress it enough so it ends today though after tomorrow I'll go back to being a thousand four ninety seven so this is the last chance to get that extra five hundred dollars off for a year okay Let's see, Andre, Andre. Hi, Diane, when screenwriting, we have to show, not tell. So they say. <laughs> but when I really flow, there's a, a lot less show. <laughs> All about getting it down, but a lot of tracking. How can I flow quickly in the required style? I say don't flow quickly in the required style, Andre. I say, like, get it down however you want. And then when you finish that whole draft, 
then you go back and you finesse it and you get rid of anything that feels like too much tell and not enough show. I'm absolutely obsessed with this. I just go like first drafts or whatever they are, whatever it takes for you to get it on the page. And I love that you get in that flow. And it's like, if you flow, if your natural flow is like telling a lot, just write it like that and then do, and then work on it later. I saw this quote the other day from Jordan Peele on Instagram <clears throat> and you know, he's the writer and director of Get Out. And he said, and I just love this quote because I went, that is exactly it. He said, I always have to remind myself when I'm writing a first draft that what I'm doing is shoveling sand into the sandbox and I get to build the castles later. And I think that's it. Like the idea that sort of, you know, that in that first draft we're shoveling sand in the sandbox and building the castle at the same time is not the case, right? So don't worry about the required style in the first draft. Just get it down and then finesse it. And then, you know, and that's, and really it's like people say that writing is 90% rewriting or something. I mean, it really is, right? Like once you have something in there, you've got sand now to build sand castles with, right? And now you start to shape it and now you start to hone it. And now you start to decide if you want to, you know, make it more show and less tell. I just want to say though, because we hear that all the time and it is essentially true. Like what you're writing in the script should be what you're seeing on the screen. Right? Obviously. <laughs> but I don't think that rule is quite as strict as a lot of people would have you believe. I mean, I just, I feel like the best screenwriters that I read, you know, bend that rule quite a lot, a lot of the time. And it doesn't mean, I think we would be really careful about giving information that's crucial in the script if we can't see it. So for instance, like if there's backstory or something and it's like, okay, someone could read it and then now they know the backstory, but how the F is the audience going to know that? That's a problem. But when it's sort of like, I don't know, when it adds psychological dimensions to what you're seeing on the screen, I think it's often very helpful. So although technically it might not be something that you can, um, that you're showing on the screen, it's something that's going to be inhabited by the actors or it's going to be conveyed by the set design or whatever, you know, or by the camera at work. I think it, you know, so I'm, I'm not as, as mad as stickler about like show don't tell, but it is generally show don't tell. Does that help Andre? I hope that helps. Okay. Lisa, <clears throat> what do you say? Should I have more than one screenplay that I'm totally happy with when I send it out? I often heard I should have at least three good scripts for reaching out to managers, agent, producers. So <clears throat> producers, you can absolutely just have one script. And the reason why is because they're not about to produce three of your scripts. It's not like, hey, I really love this. What else have you got? They don't care about that. Like either they love it and they want to make something with that or they don't. Right? And they're not immediately going to be like, what else have you got? I mean, it's possible that they read it and they go, I love your writing style. I love your voice. What else have you got? But that's fine because if you don't have anything else, you can be like, well, I'm working on such and such. You know, and that's cool, right? Managers and agents, though, it's much trickier to get them to be interested in you if all you've done is written one script, all right? And to be honest, managers and agents, you know, Everyone, I think like every writer kind of like, you want to get a manager or an agent because you're like, dude, then they're going to sell my work for me, right? <laughs> like, let me get a manager or agent because that's how you get in the rooms. That's how you sell your work. And that is kind of true. But what's also true is that managers and agents can't get you in the room unless they have something to sell, right? Because what they're doing is selling you to other people, right? They're selling you to have meetings with other people. And if all they can say is, hey, you should meet with so-and-so, they've written this great script about that, and that's all they can say, it's not much to sell in a way, right? Whereas if they can say, hey, I've got this amazing script by so-and-so, you should read it, you should meet with them, they're amazing. You know, they just did this movie, blah, 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 or they just sold this to so-and-so, or they just made this short film that's won all these awards, or they've just done this, right? Now they've got something to sell. And I think we always have to think about this, because I think, you know, when we're starting out, it's like, I want to get a manager or agent, <clears throat> but... They need to, they need like some sense of like who you are and your level of commitment before they can really commit to you in a sense. I think if you do want to manage your agent, if you've decided like the kind of thing you're writing, like you want to write in TV, for instance, you're going to want to get a manager agent, right? That's going to be very hard to get meetings if you don't have a manager agent for TV gigs. So if that's your goal, 
And it's always that thing with screenwriting. And this is really stuff that we'll be doing in the Savvy Screenwriter is you're going to be like casting your vision for what you want and then really making sure that you're in alignment with it. Because, you know, as screenwriters, we all have different end games and we all have different really deep desires about what we want to do and the kind of work we want to do. And it matters a lot, right? It, you know, we didn't sign up to this to like, I don't know, like go down paths that don't feel authentic to us. It's like, it's got to be like your true path. And so the first thing is like really knowing what your true path is as a screenwriter. And if it is, for instance, like you're like, my true path is like, I really want to work on amazing TV shows like blah, 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 fill in your favorite TV show. Or maybe you're like, I want to write the next Marvel comic movie. Or maybe you're like, I want to write like the kind of indie drama that just sweeps up the awards or maybe like I want to write rom-coms and like reinvent the rom-com for a mainstream audience or you know like what is your goal now some of these goals you will need to get an agent or manager and it's being like savvy and that is the thing about like the savvy screenwriter savvy about that like okay if that's my end goal how do I engineer this so that I'm moving towards it how do I set myself up so that I'm really moving effectively towards that goal. And I'm not just like writing scripts for the sake of writing scripts because people have said I should write scripts, right? But it's like, okay, what do I really need to do to get there, right? What are the steps to get there? And I say, this is definitely what we will be covering a lot going into deep in the Savvy Screenwriter. Like what are the different paths and what, what would different journeys look like and what are smart moves for different things? So agents and managers, like it depends again what you want to do. If your goal is to get writing assignments, you probably want to get an agent or manager and for them to consider you. Yeah, absolutely. You're going to need at least three scripts, right? You need at least three scripts to be able to be like, these are, these are my samples, you know, it's not going to be just one. But if your goal right now is to sell a script, like you, like you have one script that you freaking love and you think it should be a movie and you're like, this is, this would be amazing. You can 100% get out there and sell it now. And you don't need to have three scripts in order to sell one script. You don't need to have five scripts in order to sell one. Like you could connect to producers and pitch yourself and pitch your project to producers with only one script. And they don't care if you've written more or not. They just care about, do I love that? And by selling one script, as I said before about like the agent manager thing, like the more momentum that you have, the more things you have happening, the more appealing you are to other people. It's just the way it is. You know, if you're just like, you know, hey, I'm trying, I've got this one script, it's really amazing, <laughs> you know, it's not that exciting to people. But if you're like, yeah, I've sold the script there and I'm developing this here and I'm working on that there, you know, this is now exciting. So <clears throat> if your goal is like, really, if you've got one and you're really totally happy with it and you want to like sell it, go for it. Like totally don't wait. But if your goal is like, actually, I want to use this as a sample in order to get writing assignments, then you want to write more first. But I say, we're going to go into this in depth in the Savvy Screenwriter. We can go into like, you're sharing your plan and your exact goals so that you can get feedback on that and really work out like what is strategically the smartest, coolest, wisest, most exciting thing for you to do so that you just create the career of your dreams because that's the goal. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> you talked about LinkedIn. Are there other platforms? own website, Instagram, Twitter, where a screenwriter can build a network that you recommend, especially if I just started. The only portfolio I have so far are live stage shows about science that I produced as a PR editor. So is this even good to mention? Is there nothing to do with writing fiction? Do I need a website to introduce me as long as I have no references in screenwriting? Thank you. So I am kind of of the opinion that you don't necessarily need a screen a, a web page at any point. I, I feel like in 2023, your social media is probably more important than your um, web page. Like, I'm like, who goes to a web page other than people that you've directed them to it, right? I mean, you can have one if it makes you feel good, but you don't need one, you know? Um, but if you want to create a web page, it's like, you know, my name, screenwriter, here's who I am, here's what I'm doing, here's my project. If you want to do it, do it. But it's not, it's not in any way required. It's not necessary to do it. Um, other, you know, Instagram, I think like, I think any social media platform can be good. I think what matters is that you enjoy using it and that you connect with people in an authentic and good way on it. No doubt on Twitter, there's a lot of screenwriters. No doubt. And definitely and managers and producers and all the people there's a lot of people on twitter 
So I would definitely not discredit it, right? Instagram, there's a lot of people on Instagram. Facebook, there's a lot of people on Facebook. Instagram and Twitter are probably better for like connecting with people that you don't know, in my opinion. You know, it feels like Facebook's better for people that you've already met or people who are like so distant to you that you're, you're probably never going to meet them. So that's my intuition about it. I could be wrong. So I just go like, absolutely. I think that using any of the platforms to connect with people is a brilliant idea. And I've definitely seen on screen on Twitter, people building really nice networks and communities. You know, I, I personally have like connected with people on Twitter, which is kind of weird. I recently, I recently sort of deleted Twitter from my phone with the whole thing, the whole thing that's been going on with it. <laughs> just like, I just, I was like, I think I'm done. But yeah, so I would say, you know, choose your platform. I think in this day and age, it's, it's not a bad idea for any of us to build a social media community. Like, connections, followers, people. I think it's kind of crazy not to do it. You know, it's just a way to connect with people and build connections with people. And it's a way also as, as an artist to convey something of you and your world and how you see the world and what you are in this world. And I think that can be a beautiful thing. So I guess like one of the things I would say is that if you're using Instagram or Twitter, you're intending to use them for this purpose of kind of <clears throat> uh, in, in, enhancing your career essentially. We've got to be, again, like savvy about that, right? And smart about that, where it's no longer just like, oh, here's my kittens, you know? Um, here's this ice cream that I had, whatever, and random things. But like really like thinking like, like an artist about how you're conveying yourself, like what, what are you presenting to the world, right? And being a little bit strategic about that, I think would be smart. Again, we will be talking about this in the Savvy Screenwriter for sure, because I think it is like nowadays I go like, how do people find out about people? We look each other up on social media, right? You Google someone's name or you, you, you go into the Instagram or whatever, you know, and it's like, then I can get a sense of who you are. And it, it, it's, it's pretty a cool thing. So it's not, it, again, it's not essential. Can you be a successful screenwriter and not be on Twitter and not be on Instagram and not be on Facebook? Fuck yeah, of course you can. But if you feel like I enjoy interacting with people on this platform, I like it, it's fun for me, it's like it makes me feel connected, then do it and have fun with it. I think it's great. Um, oh, and just about the other things that you've done. Do you know, I think it's like, <clears throat> like ultimately no one's gonna buy your script or not buy your script because of what you did before, right? Like what it really boils down to when it comes to somebody reading your script and saying, I wanna make this into a movie is they freaking love the script right and I always go when it comes down to that I go why does somebody love a script and you gotta think about this like people read a lot of scripts like what is gonna make them actually read your script and go I want to spend the next two years of my life putting this together right and no movie comes together easily anyone who's been in the business for half a minute will tell you this right it's never easy so it's like for somebody to commit to making your film there's got to be something in it that really like grabs them that really like takes hold of them and it's got to, in my opinion, move them in some way. It's like either, like if it was a scary film, it actually scared them. They were reading it, they were like, oh my God, I'm terrified, I'm shit scared, I'm terrified, right? Or they're reading it and it's like just making them split their sides with laughter. Or they're reading it and they're just like mopping up the tears, right? But they're like feeling something, they're engaged with it, right? And it, it's got to be that. Because if it's not that, if they're just sitting reading it like, oh, this is a decent script, they're not gonna like be like, I'm gonna spend the next two years of my life making this. And they've got to have that feeling beyond, I guess, the actual emotional contingent, you know, that emotional piece. There's got to be some sense that like, you know, I can sell this, right? Like, I always think of it like this. <clears throat> you have to, there's a screenwriter, you're the first salesperson. And I think your script isn't just a work of art. It's actually a sales document as well. Like you're not just telling the story of the movie in your script and giving them a blueprint to make a movie. You're also selling the movie through the script. And a good script does that. A good script sells the script, right? Because in itself, it's got this like zing to it. It's got something that like grabs people in, keeps them turning the pages. It's got something and it sells itself. But you're the first salesman and you're going to convince somebody, a producer, to buy the script, to get it made, right? A producer is going to option it or they're going to buy it outright, but most likely option it. And then their job is to sell it to other people to get them involved, right? They have to sell it to financiers. They have to sell it to actors. They have to sell it to directors. Once they get those people on board, they're going to later sell it to distributors, right? And it's like, 
we're selling it and selling it and selling it, but it starts with you. And if you think about you selling it to a producer though, the producer isn't really bothered about what you did in the past. It's like, it, I mean, sure, if you've done a bunch of movies, it shows them that you've worked professionally and that you know what that's like, and that's never gonna hurt you. Now they have people that they can call up and find out what it was like to work with you. But if you've never done anything before, it's not held against you. This was totally my experience with my first script. Like, not at all. Nobody cares if you've written one script or 20 scripts or five scripts. They just care about like, I freaking love this movie and I want to get this made. Right. So it's always about that. So I just I would always counsel screenwriters to stay like focused on the work in that sense. You know, that don't overthink or don't over worry like the website, the you know, the, the my past bio, the, the whatever about myself. Ultimately, it's the work, it's the film, it's the script. Like people are either going to read that script and freaking fall for it or they're not. And that's got nothing to do with whether you worked on something or not or whether you have experience or not. They don't really care. It's like, do I love this script and can I see this as a movie and can I sell it? And that's the, that's the key. All right, my loves, let's go on down. So Dempsey, it's good to see you, Dempsey. <clears throat> I co-wrote a feature script that was purchased and produced last year. Ah, congratulations, I'm so happy. They used another writer to change it, but gave me a screenwriter credit on screen in IMDb. Amazing. I also have a TV series that's under option. Is it time for me to join the Writers Guild? It could well be. I don't know what the criteria is right now, but if you have the TV series and it's, um, if it's with a WGA signatory, this could definitely be the time. Obviously, for a lot of us as writers, there's this sort of like... Um, <clears throat> There's a little bit of a double-edged sword about joining the WGA, right? The Writers Guild, because once you've joined, you can only work with um, companies that are WGA signatories and only work for the minimums, right? And that can actually be a problem for you if you're still in the early stages of your career and you're still in the place where, like, if somebody offers you $10,000 to write a, a script, you want to take it, right? Because you're like, dude, I'm up for that. And, but it's not WGA, and it's not their minimums, and then it's a problem. So you want to join the Writers Guild at the point at which you really feel like your career is taking off to that extent, that you will mostly be working with WGA you know, signatories from that point. And definitely it gives you, I mean, there's many things that it gives you. If you join the Guild, obviously you can get access to health insurance and things like that, and all kinds of support, which is like gold, you know? But it's But it can come at a cost if you join too early in your career. So I can't say for 100% sure, Dempsey. Um, what I would do is, you know, first of all, you might want to reach out to the guild and talk to somebody there. You know, like ask somebody to, to have a chat with you and just say, like, I'm at this stage in my career, what do you think? You know, and do I, I, do I have the criteria, the necessary criteria to actually join already? What would it look like to join? When can I join and have a chat with them? You know, uh, and they're definitely always friendly and helpful. So I'm so excited for you. I'm so, I'm just like, I'm, I'm just like bursting with joy for you, Dempsey, because you just rock and you're amazing. And like for everybody here, Dempsey is an inspiration. He, for me, is like the living example of someone who has gone all in on his dreams. And I talk about this a lot, right? That thing of people who are just like willing to take the risk, willing to actually go for it. And Dempsey, you're just a living example of it. And because of that, I always like, I'm always like, I know you're like, your ultimate success is completely inevitable because you do walk the talk. Like you've put yourself out there. Dempsey sold up everything and moved to LA and just went for it. And I just like, I have total admiration for you. And I, I know that your success is inevitable because you're just like also always doing that mindset game. And I see you and I, I know that you do this. And it's like, you know, it's not to say it's always easy. And I know that too. But it's that thing that was like, when you have that mindset and you take care of it and you keep realigning yourself and you keep showing up and you keep like, you keep that positive attitude about it all, right? And you just know, you lock it in like, this is inevitable. I'm moving in the right direction. It's gonna happen. It's inevitable. And this is true for all of us. Like every single person here, there's absolutely no reason you can't have all the success you dream of, but it's all about what you're telling yourself in your head. It's really about that. I mean, yes, it's about the work as well, 100%. It's about your scripts, but it's about how you're, how you're managing your mind and how you're perceiving this journey because that's the key. All right, let's go on down. Nikki, I've never written a script. Woo, 
<laughs> my experience has been in writers' groups and writers' retreats, where should I start to learn how to lay out a script? I have an amazing course called Write Your Screenplay in Eight Weeks, which would be the ideal thing for you, Nikki. And so <clears throat> what I can do after this, I'll send you a link for it. I'll send you, there's a little, um, there is a free class that you can watch just to get an idea about it if you want to. Um, and that course is, it's golden. It, it literally hundreds of screenwriters have used it to write their first drafts. It covers everything you need to know to write a screenplay. So I will definitely, I can share the link in our group afterwards if anybody else is um, wanting to write a screenplay. All right, Deborah, hello. Lee, hello, welcome. Uh, Les, oh, I had a nice chat with Kate, Sarah and Sky. amazing. She's definitely going to go away this year to meet producers. That's fantastic. She has drive and go, yes. And Les, this is what I'm always gonna say, you know, like, the people, and that's that thing about mindset again, the people who succeed are the ones who have got that mindset game going on where they have the get up and go, where they're like, I'm going to go to that film festival and meet producers, right? And they're not just sitting at home going, oh, but it's too expensive and I don't know how and I don't know anyone and, uh, you know, and complaining about it. It's just like, make it happen, guys. If you've got great ideas and you know you could, you know, you've got great stories and things for to make into movies, like, Step up, <laughs> you know, step up and shine your light, man. It's going to happen. Shona. Oh, thank you. Glad you're not ill. Just channeling your inner Kathleen Turner. I know. Croaky voice. I'm like, oh, <laughs> I don't know what happened. As I, I feel fine. I don't know if you can tell, but I feel totally fine. I don't know. I don't know why. Christiane, going to Catan. Woo. Never really considered it in a serious way, but such a great idea. Yes. I have family party obligations for the first weekend, but there's a second week. Just found out Cam was founded on my birthday. Is that a sign? It is a sign. It's totally a sign. It's so much fun. As I say, I just feel like if you, you know, if you want to work in the film industry and you're in, you know, in wherever you are, there are these film festivals happening all over the world. Cannes is particularly incredible. I think obviously the, the big ones for film festivals, it's Cannes, Venice, Toronto, Berlin, and Sundance are like the five biggies, you know? And the reason they're the big ones is because they're film markets as well as festivals. And so <laughs> my voice <laughs> went ding. Um, so what that means is they're like people from all around the world come to them. And they're just, you know, it's just incredible opportunity to connect with people. And as I said, people, especially at Cannes, they're just having such a great time. They're so happy to be there. Everybody's like, yeah, I'm at Cannes. And so everybody's friendly and happy and at ease and, you know, happy to chat. And I say, it doesn't really matter that you don't have accreditation because everywhere you go, it's just people from the festival, like everywhere you turn. So, I mean, I've never been there with accreditation, so who knows? <laughs> Andre, oh, you're welcome. Hi, Tanya. Thank you for the ladybug. Oh, my gosh. Uh, Nina, do you register your script somewhere before you send it out? I totally do. Uh, I did record a podcast on this once about protecting your script. And if you're wanting to go into the deep thing about protecting your scripts, if you're somebody, especially, I feel like when you're a new screenwriter, it's something that you're really terrified about. Like, oh, my God, what if somebody steals my script? So if you are in that situation, please do listen to my podcast. It's called Shoot From The Heart. You'll find an episode. I think it's called Protecting Your Work. I'm not sure what number it is, but do listen to the whole podcast. That will really help you. But just the headlines here. Um, I always get a uh, an actual um, copyright from the Library of Congress in the United States. And that's the only way you can like legally copyright your work in the in the US and it is applicable to all different countries they have like agreements with all these different countries so that's what I have always done I've done that and I've also always got my WGA number right now WGA like you can register your script with WGA which is the Writers Guild and it's it's just like it's not a, it's not a legal copyright here's the deal anything that you write you own the copyright to like you don't have to do anything to own the copyright to it if you write your, you know, if you write your script, you own it, right? Like you don't need to do anything. Where things get sticky, of course, is that, you know, if you share your script with somebody and then they make a movie and it's like identical and you're like, they stole my script, is you need to be able to prove that you wrote that script, right? And because it's not like a published book, it's not on public domain or something, that can be sticky. In the olden days, there was this thing we call the poor man's copyright. Has anybody heard of that? Where what you would do is um, 
print up your script and put it into an envelope and mail it to yourself and then not open it. So there's a date, you know, it's got the postal date of when it was sent though. So if it ever came into like you needing to prove that your script looked a certain way on a certain date, you could do that. Nowadays, because of the fact that mostly we don't share paper copies of our scripts, we are, we're emailing them, right? You email your script to people, the PDF. Um, there's usually a pretty good paper trail of the script. Like you can usually pretty easily show, like I sent them the email with the script on this day, right? It's not that hard. But having the copyright to me, it just feels like that just puts you into a legal place where you're like, you have the copyright of the script and the script as it was on that day is registered in that format, you know? And often in these cases where people are, <clears throat> um, you know, c claiming that their script was stolen, the ideas were stolen, it really comes down to like how much of the things are the same because we have to acknowledge that it's 100% possible for two writers to have the same idea at the same time. We don't like to admit that. We're like, no, I'm the only one. But it's actually true that people have the same idea. And so you have to be able to prove that this person had your script. You have to be able to prove that there's enough elements that are identical, et cetera, et cetera. On the flip side of this though, so I do register the script. I don't make it, I don't like, I don't get paranoid about it. I just but I like to do that. I like to get my little certificate saying that I've got the copyright. I like to get the certificate from the WGA. It feels nice. It's fun. It makes me feel like I've written a script. <laughs> and then I just send it out and I don't worry about it. And um, just from the other side, though, please never, ever send a script to somebody who is not asked to read it. Right? It's really, really important. Uh, and when you understand this from a legal perspective, you understand why like 99% of agents, managers, producers say, we do not accept unsolicited material. And really they're just covering their own butts because the truth of it is they could very well, or one of their clients could very well be developing a screenplay that is pretty much identical to yours. I know it sounds far fetched, but it's totally possible. And now you send them a script unsolicited. They didn't ask to see it. Now you like, you got the paper trail that they got the script and all that kind of stuff. And lo and behold, you know, a, a year later, they come out with this other film and you're like, oh my God, it's the same as my film. And they stole it from me. I sent the thing to them. And this is why it's really important. That's why like 99% of people are like, we don't accept unsolicited scripts. They've got to say that because they, I mean, they could put themselves in legal jeopardy by accepting them. Did we see that? So it's really funny because I think so many writers, we get so uppity about the like no unsolicited scripts and how the heck do I get in then? but they're just protecting themselves legally. And when we see that, we go, okay, I get this. And so it's not about sort of like some snobby thing about keeping people out. It's just like, it's like legal common sense for them because it'd be a disaster to like accept unsolicited scripts. So that's why people have it. And don't ever, when you're writing a query to somebody, don't ever like attach the script ever, ever, ever. It's just a hard no. Quite often, if it does have an attachment, if you send a script, you know, send an email to somebody as a query and you have something attached to it, they will not open the email for that reason. They'll just trash it because they don't want to take that risk of you saying, oh, we open, you know, like we received your, I sent them that script and they stole my idea. So that's why, that's why it's like super important that we just like, we realize like there's a jeopardy for both of us in this transaction. What will typically happen with like really legit producers and production companies, if you query them and they decide they want to read your script, they will get you to sign a document saying that you recognize that they might be developing something identical and that you will never sue them if that is the case. Right. And it's this it's this document so that they are off the hook so that they can read it and know that if, for instance, they are developing something identical or close to it or maybe even that they're not doing it now. But like a month later, somebody else comes to them with a script that's similar and they decide to run with that because they like it. But they didn't like yours for whatever reason. Right. That they now have a document from you saying you will not sue them, that you totally accept that they might be developing something very identical and you might they might do that in the future. And that it's you know, it's it's fine. <laughs> and that can be a little scary signing that, but I just go, uh, we have to respect and understand that everybody is sort of challenged around this, you know, like we have our fears about things being stolen, but they have their fears around being sued, <laughs> you know? So everybody's got to protect themselves and then just trust that everything's going to be fine. Cause 99% of the time, no one's going to steal 99.9. .9. I'm like, nobody's going to steal your work. You're safe. Okay. Deborah said, 
How can you sell scripts on LinkedIn? So I personally have never done it, but what I want to do is do a call in the network with one of the ladies who has done it because one of the screenwriters that I know that has done it so that we can like pick her brain about exactly how that went down. And I think what I know from this screenwriter is that she, um, that she reaches out to a lot of people on LinkedIn. Like it's funny because, and I love this. I love like hearing different people's approaches. And I say, I, I definitely, I reached out to her before and said, would you be willing to do a call in the network? And she was like, totally yes. So I think we will get that scheduled with her and we can pick her brain about how she's done it. Um, and I, as I say, I think with her, she takes a pretty broad approach. It's not like what I usually advocate for, which is being very focused and narrowing it down. But she does actually send a query to a lot of people in LinkedIn, like hundreds of people, like 500 people. And then she gets like 50 requests for the script. I know it's incredible. So I have never done this though personally. And I always say like, I like everything that I teach is from my, sh my own experience. And if it's not, I, I say that because I'm like, I don't actually know. I haven't done it, but let's get Claire in who has done it. And Claire had a movie made with Kathleen Turner, funnily enough, talking to Kathleen Turner. So she would be an amazing person to have that conversation. There's another, there's another screenwriter as well that I know that sold the script through LinkedIn. So maybe we should get them both in. Maybe we should do a LinkedIn panel and find out best strategies for using LinkedIn. Let's do that. I'm gonna, I'm like, I'm gonna make a note to myself. <clears throat> cause that would be fun. I would learn from it too. Cause I say, I have not done it. All right. <clears throat> so Marina, I'm so happy to see you. I hope you're well and that everything is better in Florida. Now let's see, just curious. So if you sell your script outright, in other words, you have no more to do with it, who and how is the price of your script determined? How do you know if what they offer is too little or what you're asking is too high? So first of all, it's very rare to sell outright. What this will normally look like in most cases is a producer will love your script and they will option it. And what that means is they pay you money to have the rights to it for a certain amount of time so they can set it up as a movie. And in most of these cases, what they will then do is like get you to develop it. So they will get you to write another draft before they try to attach directors and actors and so forth, right? So you'll get paid a small amount of money for the option. Now, typically in your option agreement though, it will have kind of a guideline for what you would expect to be paid for the script finally. And as a rule of thumb, you're gonna get between two and 3% of the total budget. So that's how we know if it's too little or too high. Like sometimes in the option agreement, it will say, you know, like the baseline that you would get, you know, you're going to get WGA minute. Like if this movie goes into production, you're sure to get WGA minimum. So for instance, you're going to, you know, which is, um, I think now, I think it's like over $75,000, right? So it's like, you're going to, you know, you're definitely assured to get that. Unless the movie is of a higher budget, in which case it would be this or whatever. So it's all going to be in the, um, in the contracts, in the contracts. And really <clears throat> what I would recommend is when you do actually get a contract is it's so important to get somebody who understands these contracts, who knows these contracts to read it through for you, just to make sure that everything is legit and normal. I don't know about you guys. I can't read contracts. My brain just doesn't work like that. Like I just, I don't know. I read it and I just feel like terrified. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of embarrassing to admit, but it's true. So I just, I don't know. I just don't like them. I don't like reading them. I don't really understand them. So it's just really, and it has been from day one, important and helpful for me just to be able to give it to somebody that I trust and who knows these contracts, who can read it and say, this is totally normal. There's nothing here that's weird, you know, or it's like, I would just question this. I'm not really sure about this or whatever, but get advice. So if you get to that point that you've been given an option agreement, or a sales agreement and you want to know if it's a good one, you need to either get an entertainment lawyer or a manager to look at it or an agent, right? Uh, but it's probably an entertainment lawyer would be the best option and, and get there, get them to, to say, but I mean, basically too little or too high is totally about, um, it's all, um, uh, tied in with the ultimate budget of the movie. You know, because obviously, if they're going to make the movie for $100,000, you're not going to get a ton of money. Right? They can't give, make a movie for $100,000 and give you a ton of money. If it's, if it's being made for $100,000, they're 
per the two to three percent rule, you're gonna get two or three thousand dollars, right? If they're making it for a million dollars, right, then you're gonna get like twenty to thirty thousand, right? So it's just like it's just following that as a general guideline is gonna give you some idea of, of what to expect. All right, all right. Uh, you're welcome, Dempsey. Nikki, Lisa, has the video stopped for everyone? I hope not. <laughs> that would be hilarious. I've been chatting away here and it's like the video has stopped. I hope you go back on. Sometimes just a heads up about these Facebook Lives. I think that they're best to watch on your phone or iPad, but also if it's glitching, just, just refresh the page and it's usually fine. Daniela, my pilot got in Sundance collab. Congratulations. That's amazing. Our first meeting is tonight. I'd like to turn it into a short film so I can make it my calling card. That's awesome. Do you think that's a good idea? Is 35 minutes too long for a short? Thank you. Do you know, it's really funny because <clears throat> I would generally say it is, you know, because it's like, where is this film going to play, right? And it's like, where do short films play? Now, again, I said before, like, I don't like to teach things that are outside of my wheelhouse that I haven't experienced. I've never made a short film. I'm not an expert on short films. Right? So I totally wear that and you just want to be honest with you. I've always been under the impression that if you are making a short film, it would be wiser to make one that is shorter, you know, like 10 minutes, 15 minutes max, because most people where they're going to play the short film, obviously is in festivals, right? Like who's going to see it? How are you going to see this film? It's going to mostly be in festivals. So festival programmers typically prefer shorter films because they can have more in the program, right? They don't want one big one and, you know, it's like they want to round it out. Having said all that, if you have a short and it's like so freaking good, I mean, it's just going to be amazing and it's 35 minutes. Well, fuck it. Make the 35 minutes short, right? And you're like, this is going to be so good. <laughs> and I feel so excited to make it. And it's just going to be incredible. Then just make it. Kate Surinskaya, who Les mentioned earlier, she was a guest of ours in the network um, earlier this month, and she had made a short film. How long was Kate's film? I think it was like 40 minutes. I want to say it's 40 minutes. And it's been doing fantastically well in the, sh in the festival circuit, right? And that's the film she wanted to make. That's the film she made, and it's doing fantastic. And I think always leading with that, it's like, what do I want to make? What do I feel called to make? What feels freaking exciting to me? Follow through. Follow through. Rather than like, oh, you know, when we start to overthink it, we're like, <clears throat> but what do people say? And, you know, what's the norm? And what do, what's, what's the smart thing? And in my life and in my experience with my filmmaking, every time that I've asked those questions, it has blown up in my face. <laughs> and every time I've just gone like, I'm just following my passion. I'm just following my excitement. I'm just following what I want to do. It's always been wonderful. So it's a good idea if you feel like it's a good idea. And it's not too long if it feels essential. Okay. Neil, I'm so happy to see you. Oh, I miss you, Neil. Neil was part of our Screenwriter Pro Trilogy last year. It's lovely to see you here. Um, enjoying this Q&A. Good. Thank you. I'm having fun too. I love that quote about the sandbox. I know. <laughs> I love it too. <laughs> I'm, I'm struggling with a particularly difficult first draft right now. Anyway, I looked it up for the rest of the quote. <clears throat> and credit where credit is due. It seems to be originated by a person named Shannon Hale, not Peel. Well, thank you, Neil. That's so funny because I saw it on Instagram. It was one of those, like, is it outstanding screenplay or somebody like that? And it was definitely, they had it next to Jordan Peel. The plot thickens. The plot thickens. So, um... But thank you. I don't know who Shannon Hale is. Do you know? This is fascinating. But I love that quote too. And if it's Shannon Hale, then thank you, Shannon. It was Jordan Peele. Thank you, Jordan Peele. Um, but it's a great quote. And I think it really does just, it's a good thing to remind ourselves of. It's just like, my job here is not to build the sandcastle. It's just to shovel the sand into the sandbox. And it takes so much pressure of us to think that and just get it done. Abby, I'm so lucky to have a manager who's also a lawyer. That is gold. <laughs> you have struck gold there. That's amazing. Because managers are technically not allowed to um, negotiate your contracts for you. Like officially, legally speaking, they're not. They're not, um, they're not legally meant to do that. Agents and lawyers can negotiate contracts. But a good manager can, to be honest, like read a contract and give you some advice on it. You know, they're not officially like um, qualified to do that in a certain sense, but they can do it. 
So little by little, we're getting better. I'm so glad. Trying to get back on our feet. Fortunately, only material things are lost. Ah, uh, thinking of you. And if there is some way that we can help, let us know. Um, Sander. How do you say your name? Sander? It feels like it should be Sandra, but Sander. Would you ask to be a co-producer for your screenplay? Um, if you have written the screenplay, I mean, typically not. You know, like, what are you going to contribute to the production that would warrant you being called a co-producer? I guess that's the question, right? <clears throat> if you're the writer, you're the writer, and you should be happy with that. And I feel like it's so often, it's this feeling of control that we have, right? That we don't want to give up control. And I hear this so often from screenwriters. They're like, you know, but won't I have a say in the actors? Won't I have a say in like the sets they use? Won't I have a say in this and how they film this or how they do that? And it's like, no, you're the writer. It's not your job. And I came across this thing the other day, which I thought was just really, like it really landed for me. It was like, we try to control the things we don't trust, right? And I think for many of us as screenwriters, when we're starting out, especially there's this, a real fear that if we pass this on to these other people, they're going to screw it up. <laughs> they're not going to do it the way we think it should be done. And so we want to hold on to some sort of control. And that's why I hear a lot of people saying, you know, is it possible for me to be a co-director? It's like, not really. Like what director is like, oh, yeah, I want the writer to be a co-director with me. That's going to be a disaster. You know, and it's the same with like being a producer. Like if you're a producer, what that means is that you are part of the decision making process. But really, <clears throat> you're probably also then, you know, it's like, it's just a whole different wheelhouse. It's a whole different game. Like the ideal really is that you find producers to, to work with who get your vision, who freaking love your movie, who will fight for it, who will listen to you and, and see it the way you see it. And I always come back to this. I feel like the most successful films are made when everyone has the same vision for the movie. Everybody. And it starts with the writer and the writer's vision. And I think if the writer writes such a singular vision into their script, it's like everybody who reads that script sees the same movie, right? And that's our job as screenwriters. But our job is not then to micromanage the whole process, right? Our job is to tell the best story we can in the best way we can in such a way that everybody who reads it sees the same freaking movie in their heads, right? And it's like undeniable. It's like, this is what the movie is, Right? And then they go off and make it and we can trust them because they all know their jobs. Like our job has been done. Like we've done our job. If we've done our job, we've done our job. And now we can pass the baton on and they can run with it. And your job also when you like sell your script is to make sure you're selling it to people who you feel get your vision are going to enhance your vision, who are going to protect your vision. Right. For me, when I saw my first script, oh, my God, I was so blessed. This producer, I mean, he was so amazing. This is what I mean. Before you sell it, you know, you have these conversations. Right. And he was totally like, who do you see in these roles? Like, who do you see as the director? What do you think about this? And he wanted to involve me in everything. Now, I wasn't going to be a co-producer on the movie. There was nothing in my experience or my desire that would take me there. But of course, he's like, you know, this like like you're like we want to make sure this like flows through your vision. Right. Because the vision is so great. And I want to make sure that that happens. So when we were meeting with directors and we started meeting with potential directors for that movie, you know, it was absolutely like I was at the meetings and he wanted me to meet with the directors and for me to, you know, chat with them and, and tell them what I thought, like, is this person a good fit for our movie? And I think this is what will happen. Like, we don't need to be called a co-producer in order to be involved in this way. But we don't have like, you know, an official role that's, you know, that we are the casting person and we're going to choose these things. We have to trust. We have to trust that if we've made that first good choice of a producer for the movie, like all the other, like, you know, we're going to keep pulling in the right people, people who do see your vision. And that it's going to be wonderful. And they're going to enhance it. They're going to make it better than you could ever have imagined. And I think every screenwriter who's had, you know, like a film, it gets better. You know, it doesn't get worse after you hand it off. It like gets better. So I feel like, I mean, it's definitely worth checking in with ourselves if we're like, Thinking about saying, okay, I want to be a producer or a co-producer on the film. Ask yourself, why? Why? <laughs> like, why do I want to be a producer? Is it, do I want to produce movies? Do I want to learn how to raise finance for films? And do I want to be part of, 
you know, bro breaking deals and going to talking to agents and managers and, you know, meeting with that is like, do I want to do those things? Do I want to be part of like distribution decisions and talking to distributors and, you know, figuring out festival strategy are these things that I want to do. And if they are, then maybe you are like somebody that wants to be a producer and that's awesome. But if it's because you want to control things, then what I would suggest is like you take a beat and you go, oh, but do I need to control it if I get the right person on in the first place? Oh, thank you. I'll come out. I'll come out. I'm just about done. Thank you. That's my husband. He's so sweet. He's brought me food. <laughs> so, you know, I think it's like being really clear. Like I think as a writer, I just don't think it's necessary to be a producer unless we actually want to be producers. And it really does boil down to that. Do you want to be a producer? If you do, then great, you know, produce your work. But if you don't want to be a producer, make it your obsession to find the people who love what you're doing and who get it. And now you don't, you trust them. So you don't have to control them. You don't have to be like, I'm a producer and I'm at the table too. So I get to have my say. You're like, I am so happy. <laughs> you're freaking amazing too. And I love you. And your vision for the movie is so great. And we're going to make such a great movie together. And I get to be the writer and you get to be the producer. And it's freaking awesome. And the same with actually with, um, you know, the director and, and all those things. But you as the writer, like as I say, you're the first person, you're the number one, right? And then you're like, the first person you're going to find is your producer. And that's number two. But you don't go with anybody you don't freaking love. Just don't do it. I did it, by the way. I've done it. I've gone with a producer that I didn't love. And it was a disaster. <laughs> so I did it so you don't have to. <laughs> don't do it. If, you, if you're meeting with a producer and they don't get your vision and they seem to have a different vision, just like walk away. Even if there's money on the table, just freaking walk away from it. Like you have that power, walk away. And there will be somebody else and there will be the right person. But the, who sees your vision and who you can trust. And I say that thing about trust and control, just stick that in your brain. Am I trying to control it because I don't trust? And if I don't trust, that's a problem. Find people you trust. Okay, so I'm going to wrap this up in one minute because my husband made me dinner, so got to go. <laughs> but I'm going to read the last couple of comments and then we will wrap this up. Thank you so much for being with me. It's been so much fun. I love doing these. And if you've enjoyed this, by the way, the network, get your booty in there. We have Zooms and for when we are in the network, it's not just me talking, like we're in Zooms and it's just, this is it though. It's like all these conversations and I tell you that it's not just about being able to ask your questions and get them answered, but being in the room with people talking about these things, you know, like sharing ideas, like talking and, and expanding your knowledge and expanding your understanding of how things work and just being in the vibe and it will raise your game. You know, like everybody says one of the best things is actually just listening to other people's questions and listening to their parts of the journey and you realize you learn so much from it. So if you've enjoyed this, seriously, join the network. It's amazing. And right now you can get in for the whole year for $999 for one year, which is, it's amazing, right? Four, four Zooms a month with me. You can do this four times a month. <laughs> All right, let me see. Victoria, outside Waitrose and you're breaking up. <laughs> Bless you. Just wanted to clarify what it meant by agents. They're telling me to come back to them when it's funded. Yeah. So the fact is, though, just before I even read the rest of this, the fact is for so many agents, that is the way. It's like make us an offer. Otherwise, we're not interested because and I know this is like the hardest thing for us because we are going, we can't get the funding unless we get the talent, but we can't get the talent unless we have the funding. This is where every like every indie film gets stuck into this groove for a moment, right? And you're like, oh, I think this makes no sense. We can't get the funding unless we get talent. We can't get the talent unless we have funding. And somehow we have to find our way to maneuver this. And often it will be attracting funding like that is dependent on getting some talent. But now we can make an offer. So if you find some sort of financier who will say, we will finance your movie, you know, for this amount of money if you get us this person or this person or this person. That happens, right? And that can be a way through that. The other way is, you know, you keep persevering and find some sort of personal route to actors or whatever it is to get them attached. But it's not easier to attach an actor if you don't have money up front. Unless you're like, you know, freaking Martin Scorsese or something, then I'm sure it's easy. But if you're not a name and you're trying to attach name talent to something and you don't have money, it's extremely difficult. It's extremely difficult. I mean, sometimes, um, I don't know, I have so many thoughts on this because it's just like, you know, trying to play at that table with like these really big name actors and it's, it's not impossible. It could happen, but there could also be 
a case for like coming up with a script that maybe is more doable with less, you know, so that that is the calling card or the stepping stone to the bigger thing, you know, because these big actors, I mean, they have offers up the wazoo. Unless you're showing them a chunk of change, like you're like, I mean, there's a lot of actors, they won't consider an offer unless there's a real genuine, like financial offer made, right? It's like, what are you offering? If you make an offer, then we'll read it. They won't read the script if you don't offer. There's a ton of them like that. But they're more liable to do it if you have some other credits or some other things going on. You know, if you've done something. If it's like, oh, that well, she just made that movie that played at Sundance. Okay, now we'll read it. You know, even though we don't have the offer. So, yeah, it's tough. I mean, it's tough. No one's going to say it's not tough. But this is the, this is the business. <laughs> All right, let's see. <clears throat> they're telling me to come back to them. And keep doing the film rather than arguing that someone's nephew or someone that won't work in the rest of the game that way is better. Yeah, all I can say is, you know, <clears throat> it's not easy and it's the game we're in. So let's play it, you know, and let's just play it and have fun while we do it and figure the way out. You know, there's no, as a, if you're trying to attract, like attach big name talent, that's tough. Those people are generally booked out for the next three years anyway, right? It's like not like they've got masses of time in their schedule. And they're not, and they're getting offers from all over the place. Like big offers with people who have done amazing things. So it's like you've got to think of it from their point of view. Like why are they going to consider this offer that's like never heard of this person. They don't have any money. <laughs> like, oh, let me spend the next, you know, two hours reading the script. We have 20 other scripts that have money attached. They've got names that we know attached. It's a tough, it's a tough, it's a tough call for them. So as I say, like, I just feel like at certain points in our journey, it's like, okay, if this really isn't working, is there a different, is there a different approach that I could try? You know, is there a different way for me to go about this? Maybe I actually I put this to the side and I develop something else right now. Maybe I continue on this path, but we can't get frustrated with the system. The system, it's just what it is, you know, it's like, so it's okay. How can I find my way around this? All right. I'm writing stories based on true events. I wonder if I should keep that to myself or use it as a selling point. What do you think? Seems like the right thing to do in the age of reality shows. I know. I think like based on true events or inspired by true events, like help sell things. I really do. Um, so if you feel happy to do that, I would totally do that. You know, like inspired by true events or something. Um, but if you don't, like if for some reason it feels important to you to not advertise that fact, for the sake of the other the people involved or whatever you know i mean you don't have to but i think generally it, it helps projects a lot i remember one time looking through it's always interesting to have a look at the blacklist you know it's the list of scripts like the the quote unquote best scripts in the last year that didn't get produced and it's always interesting to look through those because these are scripts that people are reading that are people are trying to get made at a high level and it's always fun just to see like what's selling right like what is what's is, like doing the rounds at the agencies what are people responding to and You'll see a lot of true stories <laughs> right now, definitely. So I think that is a way to do it. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Go and eat. I will go and eat. Hey, I saw a Spanish fly. <laughs> there is a little one flying around. I can't read you. Oh, you're welcome, Lisa. He pairs the lovely with my morning coffee. Oh, thank you. Right, I'm going to go have my dinner and rest my weary voice. I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you so much for coming here and being a part of this live. If you're watching the replay, do hashtag replay and say hi as well. And don't forget, you have you know, until the end of tonight to join the network at that seriously discounted price. Or you can join, and I just don't want you to forget, you can join on a month-to-month -month basis. So if you do want to come in for a couple of months and just soak it up, you're like, you know what, I just want to jump in. I want to do the savvy screenwriter really get my head into this game, really learn some new skills, some new techniques, some new strategies, new ways of thinking about this, up level myself as a screenwriter, jump in for a couple of months. There's no reason not to. Thank you so much for being here again. Take care and I'll see you soon. Thank you.